please welcome Dr. Stephen Chu. Hi, pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to talk about uh, how innovation has changed the world. And it's done so in remarkable ways. Um, and there are two points. That innovation lies at the heart of the wealth of a society, and that innovation, science and technology, research and development lie at the heart of innovation. So let me start by reminding you of what um, a Nobel laureate in economics wrote about. This is a person I ran across many, many years ago, became an admirer of his, and he showed, and what he got his Nobel Prize for, is that increases in productivity were due to technology development. And so the issue at the time was the feeling that if capital investments were uh, matched to the labor force, uh, one can actually grow in productivity. But he said that's not really true because you put the capital investments, you make a new factory, whatever, uh, you produce more goods. But in the long run, what really matters in terms of prosperity and productivity per person is that you've got to get better at doing what you do. If you just do the same, uh, produce the same amount of cars for the same amount of workers, it doesn't really matter where the capital is going because in the end it just averages out and the productivity per person has to increase because you're getting better at it. And for that you get a Nobel Prize. Um, and in fact, he went a lot further to say that uh, it, you get a Nobel Prize for that because it flew in the face of uh, the mainstream economists of the day. Uh, and they showed that well over half the growth in the United States uh, was due to uh, technology development, and particularly in knowledge uh, technology. And so th what he showed by looking at case histories is that indeed it, it appeared to be true. Right. So I'm going to describe a few things, innovations that really transformed the world, perhaps not as stressed as much by historians who are not uh, scientists or engineers, but I think some of these things actually changed the world far more than who was president or king or whatever. Um, I'll start by a uh, Norgal address given by William Crooks in 1898. He's the president, he was just made president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and he starts his lecture by saying that England and all civilized countries are in deadly peril. And what do you mean by that? Europe had depleted soils, uh, even though they knew that you could take manure and other things and compost, uh, that was not enough to inert the depleted soils and the agricultural productivity in England and in Europe was declining. Uh, but what they did is they found that there were other sources of fertilizer. Uh, they used to import uh, bird guano from South America. That's a technical term for other stuff that birds do. And, um, and then they uh, latched on uh, saltpeter from Chile. And this is a nitrogen compound which seemed to really work very well. Um, and so there was a brisk business importing uh, saltpeter from Chile. But he, said, he did a little calculation and said, you know, in 10 or 20 years, 30 years maximum, based on the rise in use of this uh, incredible resource, Europe will run out. And he predicted that first hundreds of thousands and then millions of people would starve to death. So he said in his lecture, it is the chemist who must come to the rescue. Before we are in the actual grip of, of an actual dearth, the chemist will step in and postpone the day of famine to so distant a period that we and our sons and grandsons may legitimately live without undue solicitude for the future. Very poetic. So what happens? He was actually uh, spurred on by some earlier work of Wil Wilhelm Ostwald, uh, considered the father of physical chemistry. And around that time, uh, Ostwald found that he was doing experiments. Can you actually get the nitrogen from air and make ammonia? And from ammonia, you can then synthesize nitrogen compounds that uh, plants would like. Uh, and he set about in earnest trying to figure out how to make ammonia from air using some catalysis. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry, but he failed in this quest. Uh, the people who did succeed was a fellow by the name of Fritz Haber, 
And nine years after that lecture, that lecture actually set up a, a big scientific race. And nine years after that lecture, he succeeded and was awarded a Nobel Prize. He collaborated with a fellow named Carl Bosch. And the discovery of how to cat catalyze the conversion of nitrogen into ammonia was deemed so important that Carl Bosch, some years later, got a second Nobel Prize for the same work. It was deemed even more important than that because a couple of years ago, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for catalysis and uh, went to Gerhard Ertl. And in the announcement of the Nobel Prize, they said that at last, through Gerhard Ertl's work, we now are beginning to understand microscopically what is happening in the Haber-Bosch process. Two and a half Nobel Prizes for making fertilizer because it was that important. All right, so there was a more a recently a science um, uh, set of articles uh, devoted to population, um, July 2011. And um, this is the population of the world from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, roughly 1750 till um, the present time. And, uh, the Haber-Bosch process was invented where you see the arrow. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there were 700 million people. By the end of this year, there will be 7 billion people, 10 times as many. And without fertilizer, we'd be in deep trouble. However, what happened in the late 1960s was um, uh, impending doom, it was felt, and I quote one excerpt from a book, The Population Bomb, a bestseller by Paul Ehrlich, a Stanford professor. And what he wrote was, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. So what happened? Well, two years later, Norman Borlaug was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. Why? He bred disease-resistant and dwarf strains of wheat and that could tolerate artificial fertilizers rather than the natural nourishment in the soil. With artificial fertilizers, you get growth spurts. With these growth spurts, the standard wheat uh, grew so fast it would flop over and die. So he made dwarf strains of wheat uh, with heavier kernels, and you see in the right-hand picture on the left-hand side, in his, left, in his right hand, uh, are much heavier kernels. And he made them dwarf with thicker stems so they would not keel over. So these plants could deal with artificial fertilizers and they had much higher yield. Um, now, his work actually got criticized later by other, in other groups because with these bred strains of wheat, and then it was then used to make better strains of corn, better strains of rice, uh, that led to monocultures where instead of using whatever indigenous wheat you had, uh, you said, okay, these are but much better yields, and uh, it uh, allowed fertilizer use. And so he was criticized for monocultures. Uh, it was uh, against the biodiversity that people, some people liked, many people like, and uh, fertilizer. So he wrote later in life, some of the environmental lobbyists of the Western nations are the salt of the earth but many of them are elitists. They do their lobbying from comfortable office suites in Washington's or Brussels. They've never experienced physical sensation of hunger. If they live just one month amid the misery of the developing world as I had for 50 years, they'd be crying out for tractors and fertilizer and irrigation canals. So this is the world grain production from 1960 to 1970, no, to 2005. The population more than doubled between that time period of time. The upper curves, the yield and production, the blue and red curves are the average yield. Uh, this is not just the United States. Uh, in India, Pakistan, Mexico, the average yield went up five times per acre. The other stunning thing is uh, you actually see the area harvested and seeded. And during that time, when the population more than doubled, food production quadrupled grain production, the amount of land put under cultivation remained the same. A true revolution. 
right? And so, to be sure, uh, well, first hundreds of millions of people didn't starve to death. People do starve to death, but it's more an issue of economic distribution than it is of the ability to grow food. Now, <clears throat> but are we really postponing the inevitable crisis? Harbor and Bosch and artificial fertilizer allowed the population to grow from the beginning of the 20th century to the mid-20th century, and the population has grown even further. If you look at a graph like this going back a million years of the human population, you get the sense of, hmm, are we going out of control? Uh, between 1800 and 1930, and you go one to two to four, we're now at seven billion people, and it will take only 13 years to add another 13, uh, to add another billion people. So if we just postponing kicking the can down the road, and this is really what we're facing. So the good news is no. Um, if you look at the projection of population growth, it begins to slow down. And by mid-century, we are predicting 9.3 billion. And by the end of this century, it's actually projected to plateau and begin to decline. And in a number of developed countries, the population is already declining. In fact, in some countries, which don't have boosts from immigration, uh, it, they are very worried about the decline population. In one country, the fertility rate is now going down to 1.1. Now, just as a, I'm a physicist, but a lesson in biology, the fertility rate is, uh, in order to get a, a, a steady state population, you need something about 2 to 2.2. You actually need 2.1 to 2.2. You know, every two people produces another two people. All right? So you got two people producing one person. Uh, and so what are the reasons? Well, the reasons are multi and varied. Um, my theory is, well, here's, here's at first what the correlations are. Uh, a very strong correlation between the fertility rate and the amount of women who are educated and what is plotted on the left-hand side of the percentage of girls enrolled in secondary schools. And as the percentage goes to 100%, the total fertility rate actually goes below two. Uh, the other thing is fertility and poverty. Uh, the poorer you are, the more children you have, because in a very poor country, you don't expect all your children to uh, survive childhood. And uh, that is also part of your social security. So you have six or 10 kids, and maybe four or five of them survive, and maybe one or two of them would be willing to take care of you. Uh, and in the modern prosperous world, it's a very different story. When you have children that are born, you expect them to live a full adult life. And the other thing is, they expect you to put them through college. <laughs> also, uh, with, uh, uh, against poverty, um, is uh, things like other distractions like television and late night TV, and that may have an effect on fertility. But never mind. <laughs> okay, um, the provost spoke about transformative technologies. Uh, let me tell you of uh, transformative technology. It's, it was uh, electronics and the ability to use electronics to amplify signals. And in, I, was, I spent nine years at Bell Laboratories. And since an essential component of the transcontinental telephone was the vacuum tube. For those young people in the audience, what is a vacuum tube? That's a vacuum tube. Um, and um, Bell Laboratories uh, um, bought the patent for the vacuum tube. It was ironic because uh, Lead Force, the inventor of the vacuum tube, actually didn't understand how it worked. He thought that this blue glow in the thing was part of the mechanism. And the blue glow was, glow was due to electrons hitting residual gas that made the vacuum turn up to burn out faster. But never mind that. Bell Labs soon figured out what was really going on. They became the major developers of vacuum tubes early, early on before it was even called Bell Labs. Davison uh, joined Bell Laboratories during World War I uh, to work on the war effort. And Bell Laboratories was the major developer. And they worked on vacuum tubes for a number of applications. He liked the company, he liked the atmosphere, he liked the idea that you have some freedom, and if you, even though you were there to improve the technology and get uh, a product out, you could take little diversions. Uh, so he stayed at Bell Laboratories after the war. And then in the uh, uh, 
few years after the war, there was a, uh, a proposal that, uh, that it had to do with the fundamentals of a new theory of microscopic matter called quantum mechanics. And it said that you have to describe these particles, like atoms or electrons or so forth, that they had particle-like properties, but they also could be described and need to be described in terms of a wave equation, a so-called Schrodinger equation. Before Schrodinger wrote down the equation, de Broglie said that based on a simple other arguments, you were led to believe that they, these particles had to have wave-like properties. And, um, and so what Davison and his technician, Lester Germer, did is they took these electrons from the vacuum tube they scattered them off a piece of metal in this tube and measured how they reflected. And lo and behold, they found that these electrons reflected and obeyed the same laws as Bragg diffraction, which how the way x-rays uh, were scattered off of a crystal. And so they said, oh my gosh, this is exactly the same because it's wave properties of those x-rays that actually allow you to derive those laws of Bragg diffraction. So he gets a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, Bell Labs first of over a dozen Nobel Prizes. Um, now, but the root of the matter was Bell Laboratories was trying to make better vacuum tubes. The essential part of a vacuum tube is you take a piece of metal, a wire, and you heat it red hot and electrons come out. And then you collect the electrons on a plate and you put a little wire mesh in between where the electrons are coming from and where you're collecting. And by adjusting very small amounts of voltage and current in this little grid, you can modulate how many electrons get across the side. That's the essential feature of how a vacuum tube, a triode, works. But they use a wire and it burns out. It gets really hot. And so Bell Laboratories started with tubes that lasted a few minutes to hours to years, and they ended up with tubes in, uh, that were going for six plus years, maybe 10 years, which is incredible because I remember when I was a kid, we had a vacuum tube television. Those tubes only lasted about a year or two. You had to take them all out, go to the hardware store and test the tubes. Um, a young, brilliant theorist named William Shockley joins Bell Labs and he wants to work for the great man Davison and vacuum tubes. Uh, but he said, no, we've got something better. In the end, long run, we're looking for a substitute for vacuum tubes. We want a solid state version of a vacuum tube. So one thing led to another. A group was formed, and over a nine-year period, they developed things that led to the invention of the transistor. So they did not stumble on this invention. It was a concerted effort that really said, we're going in this direction, and uh, assembled a great number of uh, great scientists. The people who were awarded the Nobel Prize for this, Bardeen, Bertin, and Shockley, are shown here. Now, Bardeen and Shockley are theoretical physicists. Bertin is standing in the background. He's the person who actually did the work. Um, and the reason Shockley is standing there, uh, sitting there, pretending he's actually doing an experiment was because he was the department head. <laughs> For those of you who want to know, this is what the transistor looked like. It's, uh, it's something only a mother could love. Um, but it was a humble beginning that led to a lot of great things. The first integrated circuit was no prettier. In fact, it was a little uglier. Uh, but it, the transistor, and because of the solid state vacuum tube, if you will, and the integrated circuit, uh, we now have amazing things where the design rule of the highest density integrated circuits that Intel makes are 22 nanometers. That's roughly 100 atoms wide. And, um, so if one has come a long way. So the integrated circuit really transformed electronics. There are a lot of things that transformed the way we communicate with each other. Optical fibers uh, and wireless communication where you see an iPhone and an iPad. And so fantastic things that really transformed, these innovative things really transformed how information uh, flows around the world. Let me go to innovations in transportation. Uh, after the Industrial Revolution, uh, you could, you were no longer dependent on human and animal power for your source of energy, uh, or, well, th that's not your source of energy. Your source of energy is food, the uh, animals and people eat, but never mind that. So that's solar energy and biofuels. Um, but 
you could actually get tremendously much more power from, for example, steam engines. And here you have a steam engine, and it's uh, at a stop, and it's about to transfer some freight over to a um, uh, more local form of transportation, uh, a horse drawn carriage. Um, a little bit about the development of the railroad in the United States. Uh, it started, um, as I said, in the Industrial Revolution. But uh, during the bleakest moments of our country's history, the Civil War, you would think that the country could not spare uh, anything and had to devote all its resources to fighting a war. But the country didn't. And in 1862, Lincoln signed the Railroad Act, which said, uh, we will pick two companies. And with these two companies, we will fund the building of a transcontinental railroad, because none of the private railroad companies were willing to put a railroad across the country to connect California with the eastern states. And it was a huge subsidy, $16,000 in bonds per mile to the rail companies. And then alongside of a track, there would be a 10-mile square block of land that would be given to the rail companies. And in the next 10 miles, there would be another 10-mile block on the other side. The rail companies could either sell the land or, or develop it. And, um, that led to an aggressive building of the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, and it was completed in 1869, just seven years later. Nowadays, it would take seven years to get a permit. But by 19, 1870, a journey that took over six months was shortened to less than two weeks because of the Transcontinental Railroad. Dramatic change in transport over long distances. Another Another great innovation was steam-powered ships. And this is one of my favorite paintings by one of my favorite artists, Turner. And it has to do with an old warship um, that distinguished itself in the Battle of Trafalgar, it is being towed by a steam tug up the Thames to be berthed and then broken up for scrap. And so you see this lovely juxtaposition of the old romantic sailing ships uh, being towed by this ugly, black, belching, iron, steam generating tugboat uh, and a beautiful sunset. But just to remind you that uh, sail power was replaced by steam power uh, and that transformed shipping. So the railroad and ships actually began to transport goods and people over great distances for relatively low cost. Let me talk about the airplane. Now, I'm going to start the story not with the Wright brothers. Actually, you can start way back, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, but never mind. I start with a person by the name of Samuel Langley, uh, a very distinguished scientist, a mathematician, a physicist, and astronomer. And he got a grant of $50,000 from the War Department and $20,000 from the Smithsonian in 1898. He had been starting to play around with uh, powered gliders. And they said, well, why don't you make a bigger powered glider to make it into an airplane? And so here's some money. Um, and so off he went, trying to put engines on these power, uh, rather scale up the powered gliders to get people on. Uh, this is a picture of a power glider with a person on it being launched off a little catapult in the Potomac. And uh, I don't know if you can really tell what's happening, but that trajectory is going the wrong way. It crashed. And so there was an early crash in October of 2000, uh, sorry, 1903. And um, in December 8, the second crash in 1903, Langley says, this isn't going to work. It's putting the pilot at risk. I give up. Now, after that, nine days later, the Ripers succeeded at Kitty Hawk without any government support. Some members of Congress were outraged. I can see it now. The government can't pick winners. What are you doing investing in things? Let business figure it all out, and so on and so forth. Uh, so some things don't change, except it's gotten a lot louder. With, but anyway. Um, so that's what happened. But that's not the full story. As I said, the first power flight came some nine days later. But what is forgotten 
is that very soon thereafter, the military began purchasing, was the primary, if not sole purchaser, but certainly the primary purchaser of all the airplanes of, of uh, the Wright brothers, of Curtis and the competitor, and so on and so forth. And um, by the beginning of the war, they had purchased dozens and dozens of airplanes, uh, tabulated that um, up until from 1909 to 1919, they had purchased some 60 different models, about half of them uh, before World War I. But it was clear by 1914, the beginning of World War I, the United States lost the lead in airplane technology. Why do I say it was clear? When the United States entered the war, and even before the war, when they began to supply the Allies with airplanes, the Allies gently told them, why don't you build our design because yours don't work so well? And so the U.S. agreed, and they built uh, a British de Havilland, a DH-4, and they turned on their great industrial machine, and by the end of the war, uh, they were building uh, some 14,000 uh, airplanes one year. Uh, but the war ended, and by 1920, the production really crashed to some 300 airplanes. And so the air industry uh, was collapsing. Uh, also, people decided we can try to get the lead back from Europe. And so in 1925, Congress passed the Kelly Air Mail Act, and it allowed private companies to carry the precious U.S. mail. So it gave them a market. And um, it also, the Air Commerce Act, and, and this is also very important, actually uh, said something else. You know, you said there's a lot of barn burners and things going on, you know, people going on airplanes. There are a lot of crashes, and this might not be good for uh, a beginning industry if everybody's crashing. So why don't we uh, set up a thing that could actually put in some standards, minimal standards for pilot training and minimum standards for how you would make an airplane. So the big hand of regulation reached in and actually helped save the airline industry because if they don't crash, people are more, you know, even the precious U.S. mail, you don't want your precious mail to crash. So in any case, uh, this is what happened. Um, the airline industry in the United States had a very intimate relationship with um, the commercial airline industry had a very intimate relationship with the military. This is a picture of a test flight of um, a precursor to uh, a tanker plane called the KC-135, built by Boeing, and it's being put through its paces, banking very hard. And when Boeing got a big contract to make these tanker planes, they said, aha, this is what we need, because there's a cost-plus contract. Uh, we'll produce a similar airplane, we'll put some windows on it, and we'll call it a 707. So, um, so to say that the commercial airline industry went ahead without government support is actually uh, not correct. Now, many years later, here's a Boeing 787 that's uh, going to be delivered, I hope, in a, a half a year or so. Um, uh, and there was a columnists in the New York Times who wrote an article lamenting we're in uh, a dearth of new innovation, you know, we're here of Uganda and Omaggio, so to speak. Um, what's going on? Airplanes are pretty much the way they were 40 years ago. Uh, not quite. This one uses only 30% of the fuel as a 707. Other than that, and it flies at Mach 0 0.85 instead of Mach point six or seven. So other than that, it's the same. Um, the point here is that trains and planes and ships revolutionize the transports of goods and people. You go to the market, you, will eat, you can eat fresh fruits, you can eat fish, sometimes grown across the United States and other parts of the world, including halfway around the world. Uh, fresh produce and things of that nature. So it really transformed the way people move and the way we move material. Another huge transformation was the development of the automobile. Now, let me remind you that Henry Ford did not invent the automobile or the internal combustion engine, 
Daimler and Benz did in Germany. But what Ford did do was in, improve. He didn't even invent the assembly line, but he improved upon it. And with this assembly line, uh, they were able to make high quality, low cost automobiles, and the productivity per worker went up enormously. So let me reiterate what I just said. We didn't invent this thing. We came, became the low cost producer of this object. And because the price declined so much, it actually created a mass market. Dambler and Benz make ex made excellent automobiles. They still do, uh, but not quite reachable to the mass market. And because of that, the number of workers uh, in the automobile industry skyrocketed because you reached a different price point and then you could sell this stuff. Same thing with personal computers. When personal computers cost $10,000, $5,000, nobody bought it. Once they started to cost $2,000, $1,500, it went viral. So now, I didn't read um, Tom Friedman's book. We do talk, uh, maybe we feed off of one another and we talk numerous times, but let me tell you about something that I visited a solar plant in China, it was called SunTech. It was then the third largest photovoltaic producer in the world. Uh, its founder was a, an Australian citizen. He got his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of South Wales. He was born in China, but he was, his higher education was in Australia. He went and said, well, I want to start a business. I think we can make better solar cells. Australia wasn't interested. China said, why don't you come back? We'll help finance this and get you started. So when I toured the factory, this one happens to be, this is one of their factories. It's 100 meters wide by 400 meters long by four stories of production lines. And uh, these are automated production lines, very few workers. Where do they get the silicon? United States. Why? It says, oh, the CEO says, energy in the United States is so cheap. We can't compete with that. So we'll take the silicon. We'll put into wafers. We'll put it, we'll dope it. We'll do all the high value, high technology, value added stuff. And oh, by the way, if Germany or Spain and the United States want to assemble these things, that's okay too. We can figure out how to do that because the real heart of the thing we can make and we can make it better and we can make it cheaper. And in fact, it's not, and I stress also better, right now this company holds the current record for polysilicon solar efficiency, 16.5% going to 18. All right. They took what Henry Ford did and did it better. Okay, and that's actually what they're doing in many, many technologies, uh, in all the energy technologies. And they remake. They just looked at what the United States playbook was over the last uh, century and a half and said, "I think we can do this too." Um, all right. Now, gasoline-powered internal combustion engine were really rapidly replaced horsepower vehicles. If you look at any energy related technology or deployment, it usually takes about a half a century to build up the new infrastructure. This one took uh, maybe 20, 25 years. And so you see these pictures in the late 1880s, 1890, uh, where it's dominated by horse drawn carriages. Occasionally you see a horse drawn cable car or an electric cable car. Um, uh, but by 1920, the scene had rapidly changed. You see in Detroit uh, lots and lots of cars and a few cable cars, and by the uh, mid-1940s to late-1940s, you only see gasoline-powered or diesel-powered vehicles. Uh, very ra rapid. You also don't see many streetcars uh, during this time. Um, in part because the automobile manufacturers bought the streetcar companies and closed them down. But another thing that hastened the transition to uh, internal combustion vehicles uh, was an environmental pollution problem uh, that would, had occurred. Well, what environmental pollution? This is, right, 1910, 1920, 1800. What's the environmental pollution problem? Well, it's horse manure. And in New York City, for example, in 1880, there were uh, 16, 000, 160,000 horses 
producing three to four million pounds of horse manure a day, an equivalent amount of horse urine a day. There were piles uh, in vacant lots that were piling up 40, 50, 60 feet tall. Um, uh, the market for fertilizer manure was saturated, uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, it was piling up uh, so fast and furious that a new business enterprise started. They were called crossing sweepers. And if you were a genteel person in New York City and wanted to cross the street, there would be a little sweeper that would uh, clear a path for you. So you wouldn't have to step on as much horse manure. Um, so it was this environmental problem that actually quickened the transition to the new form of transportation. We have another environmental problem. It may not be quite as visible or quite as an assault on our senses as horse manure, and this is greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. And so you see it's puttering along, puttering along. This is data. Uh, and then it starts to rise. And in the beginning of uh, the Industrial Revolution, it begins to climb. Um, so what has happened is that these greenhouse gases uh, trap heat uh, on the earth and uh, prevent it, uh, as much of it from escaping. Uh, the other fact you have to know is that we have satellite data over the last 35, going on 40 years, which tracks how much sunlight energy reaches the earth. Not only the visible light, but also the infrared light, also the sunspot activity, the ions hitting the earth, the microwaves, everything. And they're amazing, there's an 11-year solar cycle, but if you average over three solar cycles, it's amazingly flat. So on the long time scale, we believe that the amount of energy hitting the earth is constant, but the amount of energy leaving the earth is less, all right? So imagine the amount of energy you use uh, by metabolism, exercise, whatever, is constant, but, but the amount of cheesecake you eat has gone up. Something will happen. Similarly, due to conservation of energy, although we cannot, we do not know today uh, the intricacies of on a five-year, 10-year, 15-year cycle what is happening, over a 50 and 100-year cycle, because that's, that has a lot to do with um, ocean currents and the interactions of the biosphere uh, with the increased temperatures and things like that. So very, very complicated stuff. But over a 50 or 100 year period, it gets simple again. Energy in the same, energy out less. Something will happen. And you would have to explain very hard that uh, something, uh, that nothing will happen. And so um, that's what we're facing. Um, so it was this environmental awareness of every, every OECD country except two in the world recognize, whose political systems both conservative and liberal systems recognize, uh, and also not only OECD, but all, all, all the developing countries that I know of, uh, you know, China and India and Brazil and Mexico, and so on also recognize that uh, the, the climate issue is a real risk and we have to do something about it. The only two countries that don't are the um, United States and Russia. Russia because its entire economy is uh, built around extractive industries, namely oil and gas, and they think, well, if it warms up a little bit, that might not be so bad for Mother, Mother Russia. And uh, the United States, well, we can talk about that some more, but not now. Um, <laughs> So let me talk about the fact that we need innovation in energy, that innovation in energy is essentially going to be a second industrial revolution, but this time it gives the energy we've gotten used to and what developing countries want, but in a clean, sustainable way. So here's one. Uh, the, uh, there have been steady progress in solar power. The blue curves are, this is a Moore's, it's not a Moore's law, it's, it's called an experience curve where you have the price, but on a logarithmic scale, and you have units delivered, and what you find is you're established this learning curve. There's a little stutter here, a shortage of, poly sil of silicon, but that has corrected itself. But actually, something has happened. The price of solar is going down faster than the previous learning curve over the last two years. And then uh, thin film technology, this happens to be cadmium telluride. And so, uh, in the last six years, the price 
not only of the modules, but the full installation price of utility scale solar has dropped by 50%. Every business model says the full all-in costs will drop by at least another 50% in this decade. And um, what do you, what we think will happen is those business models, but in the Department of Energy, we're looking at uh, these are what the costs are today. Um, it's a little under uh, $4 now. Uh, the uh, yellow is, the, the blue is the module itself, now selling for about $1.10 a watt. Uh, and just five years ago, it was selling for $4 a watt. And um, the yellow is about the balance of systems. And so we look very hard about what can we in the Department of Energy do to decrease this so that the price would drop down to a dollar watt. Why a dollar watt? A dollar watt means the levelized cost of electricity from solar would be, uh, would be the same or less than with any new form of energy, including natural gas, at $4.50 a million BTU. Okay? So, even, so we think that even a dollar fifty a watt, this will go viral. It will go viral all over the world. So the question is, do we want to import this stuff or, or do we want to export it? And uh, we feel very strongly that, no, we want, to be ex we want to be making it, inventing improvements, and exporting it. Another friend of mine, Michael Spence, another Nobel laureate in economics, wrote a recent paper, uh, came out a couple months ago, and he divided the economy into two sectors, what he called tradable jobs. These are goods and services that can be produced in one country and shipped around the world. Airplanes, cars, electronics, chickens. Chickens are tradable. Uh, <laughs> and, and so on. Are not tradable jobs. Uh, and these are goods and services that have to be produced domestically. Government jobs, not tradable. I am the US Secretary of Energy. It's non-tradable. <laughs> um, uh, healthcare, construction, much of legal services because the laws in different countries, in fact, indeed, in different states are different. So that's, they divided those sectors and then they discovered from 1990 to 2008, employment grew by 27 million jobs. Sounds great. Virtually all of it was on the non-tradable sector. Any job where you actually, in the aggregate, not any job, but in the aggregate, uh, the tradable side of the economy, where we have to compete with the rest of the world, did not grow at all. Here are non-tradable jobs, government, healthcare, retail, uh, hotels, accommodations, food service, construction, dry cleaning, those are non-tradable jobs. You don't send your dry cleaning to Europe. Well, some may, but we, I can't. In fact, I don't even believe in dry cleaning, but never mind. Uh, these are the tradable, uh, manufacturing in three sectors. I take a little difference. They, they, they classified finance and insurance as tradable. It's partially tradable, partially not. So that's the only tradable one that went up. And if you divvy that up, you'll find that the um, tradable insurance um, and finance uh, did go down. And agriculture and electronics and automobiles and so on. All right? Now, What's the value added per job? Well, the tradable ones went up a lot higher because if you have a job, you have a supply chain, you also have service jobs, the non-tradable ones that actually go to service the people who have the tradable jobs. And so this doesn't even include that. This just includes the value added and um, the non-tradable ones went up a little bit, but most of it is in the tradable part. So this economist echoed what Robert Solo echoed, what uh, others, a few others have echoed, and they say not all jobs are created equal. Okay. And uh, that's a very important lesson. So let's talk about a few other technologies. Um, Oregon National Lab uh, made some discoveries uh, in batteries. Uh, we invented the lithium ion battery, uh, both the lithium ion with the cathode being uh, cobalt phosphate and then lithium ion iron phosphate. Uh, 
the person actually was supported by the Department of Energy, but it was Sony that made it commercialized first, and then uh, Japan uh, for, dominated the lithium ion battery market. Uh, Korea came along and they're fighting it out. And the United States in advanced batteries, rechargeable batteries, uh, has about one or two percent of the market, even though we invented it. Uh, we think we can get this one back, just as we got airplanes back. Um, Ford automobiles are actually coming back quite strong. After a near-death experience and after the death experience of GM and Chrysler, we think that they may be able to come back. But, but this grew out of research at Argonne National Laboratory out of a synchrotron facility. This is a light source based on particle accelerators that were developed for high energy physics research. It then became to be used for mostly material science research and structural biology research and pharmaceuticals. But out of this grew a better understanding of the uh, mesoscopic uh, physics and chemistry in lithium ion batteries. A little manganese could go a long way. The batteries became safer, cheaper, easier to manufacture. Uh, and uh, uh, the rest is history because this first discovery made 10 years ago is now in a Chevy Volt battery. We actually are making a number of other, we're investing in a number of other battery technologies, very, very exciting. As they go around the world, I have to tell you that the best ideas are still coming out of uh, research universities, out of national laboratories, out of inventors in garages. So that part has not changed. We're also using supercomputers to understand very complex air flows. Uh, you all know that these, these streamlining that go above the cabs of trucks uh, took only a year or two became, before they became ubiquitous among truckers. Um, uh, then with additional studies of how air flows go around trucks, one could understand how to streamline the bottom of the truck with a little plastic widget as shown down here. And we think that this will add an additional 7 to 12 percent fuel savings in long distance trucking. Just this little piece of plastic. Came out of high performance supercomputing. Other supercomputers have been used to design high performance, low emissions diesel engines with Cummings. Uh, so they skip the entire build, design, check it out, and redesign and rebuild and check it out step. It was designed on a high performance computer. They built one prototype, it worked as expected, they went into production. So again, there is real space for technology, and we still lead in this. We have to capture carbon from coal plants, from gas plants, from cement plants, uh, from you name it. Otherwise, we'll be in big trouble. And so uh, how do you decrease the cost of the capture of this? And so you run the flu gases or whatever uh, through something that catches the carbon dioxide it turns out that the rate of absorption of the carbon dioxide on a material, uh, you get a faster rate, but it, it seems to be proportional to how deeply bound uh, the carbon dioxide is on this material, like an amine. And so wouldn't it be better if you could actually have the carbon dioxide attach very quickly into a fluid or on a surface, and then with very little energy, release it? Actually, you do this, you figured, maybe you haven't figured it out, but you do this uh, every time you exhale. In metabolism, you generate carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide has to be transported out of the body. There's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that increases the rate of absorption of the carbon dioxide into your bloodstream, goes to your lungs, you just exhale it. You're not heating up anything. It's all done at body temperature. Uh, why can you do this? It has to do with the free energy of what's allowed, but it's the magic is in the enzyme. And so the question is, can you get this enzyme to work in a flue gas environment? Can you get it to work not at body temperature, but at 75 or 80 degrees C? Can you get it to work in a high concentration of amine, five molar or three molar concentration, because a normal enzyme would just curl up and die, and most proteins begin to actually uh, unravel at 75, 80 degrees centigrade. So we're sponsoring a number of research to do that. One's a very synthetic way of getting this type of enzyme to survive in a flue gas environment. Um, let me tell you another way that we're also sponsoring. This is really cool. 
It's called directed evolution. What you do is you have an enzyme defined in nature, and you just shuffle up the, the enzymes and make a new generation of these things. Some of them, many of them don't survive. And then you put it through a test. You put a little bit of amine in it, you raise the temperature a little bit, and you see which ones survive. And then you take the survivors, and you shuffle their genetic material, and you mutate some more, and you throw it back in, but you up the temperature and you up the amine solution a little bit more, and you see what happens. So the great thing about microbes is um, there are no people to protest this, um, <laughs> animal rights people. Um, and the other thing about it is you can, have, you can make generations of these things. Now, that's what's called directed evolution, and the inventors of this are now getting prizes. It's a big deal. Uh, but there's directed evolution 2.0. And let me describe that. In normal directed evolution, you just pick the best of the survivors and you, and you change the environmental conditions and you hope that it evolves. In directed evolution 2.0, what you do is there's an algorithm that begins to identify which genes, which proteins actually seem to work towards survival. But sometimes you can discover a gene where the overall set is not good, but this one seems to be helping in some way. So without going into the details of that, you can then take, and this is, you, you shuffle the genes, the, the green guys, let's say, are good ones, the red guys are not so good ones, but you take all the ones that have some good in them, even though the overall effect may not be net good or the best. And then you do another shuffle, and then you do another shuffle. So it's going a little bit deeper into what's responsible for the behavior you want. And so after four generations, they took an enzyme that couldn't survive more than 30 or 40 degrees centigrade. And the combination of temperature and high amine solution, that, that was the figure of merit, they got a 100,000-fold improvement. And uh, Right now, uh, if you can get this enzyme just the last three months instead of a day, uh, you have something commercially viable that's ready to go. It would be much, much better. So it's a combination of this enzyme and amine. Again, this is some of the really cool stuff that's being invented in the United States and that we support. So I think the, the, the moral of what I'm trying to say is that America does have an opportunity to lead in these clean energy technologies. Um, uh, we remain the most innovative country in the world, but invented in America is not good enough. You don't want a box where an iPhone and iPad to say, invented in America, assembled in China. Uh, you really want it to say, invented in America, made in America, and sold worldwide. Because remember the economy, the tradable part of the economy, if we just have untradable parts of the economy, and our whole economy becomes that, we will still be importing things. So again, as a physicist, there's a net conservation law, okay? <laughs> you're not creating wealth to the outside world, but you have, you have to buy things from the outside world. This is not good. And so, um, you know, so I was listening to the provost's introduction. That used to be us. Uh, the message is we can become us again. We did in many other sectors. We better become us again in the energy sector. Thank you. Thank you.